College Secretary, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I want to thank Tom Malloy, our Communications Officer, for organising this evening and for inviting me to address you. I was elected to the Senate in 2011 on a platform of reform, transparency and accountability, as well as a promise to bring a high level of economic expertise to the Eructus. As an associate professor in the Department of Economics for four decades, I gave many lectures here in the Edmund Burke Theatre and enjoyed also serving as junior dean under three provosts, uh, president of Dubes, vice president of the HIST, vice president of the Choral Society, treasurer of Dukak, and president of the soccer club on one of two occasions when we won the Collingwood. It's been an honour to represent college for these past five years. I will continue to stand for increased transparency in public policy making and increased accountability in politics and economics, while remaining a staunch defender of the autonomy of Irish universities, with Trinity leading by example. I have made it my mission in the Senate to bring the expertise of my links within college, having served on board on four occasions, with all the other disciplines to bring legislation to Leinster House. The bills I have introduced include a bill on copyright, two bills on university education, two bills seeking to improve the housing and mortgage sector, a financial stability and reform bill, and a Shannon's electoral reform bill, which would give, a, would give a vote to all graduates. Trinity has served the Shannon well. We bring the wisdom of 66 academic departments uh, to the Parliament. It is vital now, more than ever, that Ireland has a high level of economic expertise in the ear of the government to ensure that the mistakes of the past are not repeated. The Shannon needs someone who will bring critical, serious thinking to bear on its day-to-day -day business. If you vote for me to represent Trinity College alumni in the next Shannon, I will bring the vision of the following, advocating a practical solution to the housing crisis, bringing about a fairer economic recovery, ensuring that higher education is allowed to develop, supporting transparency, openness and accountability in government, including the civil service. As the only independent member of the banking inquiry, I will bring its lessons to, into legislation to prevent a recurrence of those costs which were 64 billion gross and 40 billion net. That banking crisis led to the housing crisis. I will put forward real and effective solutions uh, to bring house prices back into line with incomes. I will bring your concerns about the future of education in Ireland to the Oireachtas. I have tabled two private members' bills relating to higher education reform. On multiple occasions, I have called upon the government to seriously address the lack of qualified mathematics teachers at second level. I remain a staunch defender of university autonomy and increased third level funding. The international evidence is that the more autonomous the university it is, the better it performs. The university and higher education sector needs to be given the capacity to plan and flourish into the coming decades as it meets the challenges of a more demanding workforce and to defend the role of the arts and the humanities along with the sciences to create a knowledge-rich society. I will also develop the links with Northern Ireland uh, in a crucial role in furthering the peace process. Are the connections between Trinity and its graduates, both unionists and nationalists uh, in Northern Ireland? In conclusion, I believe that Ireland can become a great society in which the economy serves the people, not the other way around, in which young people can aspire to own a home and live their lives with the same freedom their parents had, and in which education at all levels is valued for the way in which it enriches our lives and enables us to contribute to an ever-diversified world. Thank you for your attention here today. I ask for your number one vote. Gara Margaret. Well, first of all, may I say thank you to Trinity for organising this event. Uh, this is the first time any such event has happened, and I have to say it's very welcome, because I remember the days when Trinity produced a disastrous universities bill, and only for my intervention, which managed to stop it in its tracks and give Trinity six weeks to amend the thing, uh, there would have been a really problematic situation from Trinity. In the old days, they didn't engage with the senators at all. I'm glad to see the start of this engagement. Uh, we're in a critical state at the moment, politically. Uh, we, appear to, we have a hung doll. The negotiations between Enda Kenny and Michal Martin have broken down this evening. Uh, the Fianna Fáil people have uh, rejected Enda Kenny's suggestion. So we may very well have a situation where there's a minority government. If that happens, then the university senators will hold the balance of power. 
That makes them critically important. This happened once before, and I used it to introduce a very interesting transport bill. So there's the possibility of real change in the Senate. And even if this doesn't happen, we're in a very good position to urge Shannon reform. I spoke to Michal Martin yesterday, and I said to him, I'm very interested in what he said about the need for an independent and professional doll. And I said, what about the Senate? Shouldn't that be independent? Shouldn't that be professional? We need reform of the Senate, and I've campaigned on this now for many years. There are things that we can do without a referendum. We can revise the nominating bodies, bring them into the 21st century. We can enfranchise the ordinary members of those. Think how wonderful it would be to have the doctors and surgeons and nurses electing somebody with critical information and professional capacity uh, in that area. So there is a lot that we can do with the Senate to bring it into the 21st uh, century. Um, there have been two major referenda during this period. One was the referendum to abolish the Senate. That was going down the drain. It was two and a half weeks to go. Now, we were losing hand over fist. I discharged myself from hospital, came in and made a pretty fiery speech that you can see uh, on the internet or on my website. Uh, and together with Sean Barrett and John Crown, the three of us turned that around and saved the Senate within two and a half weeks of disaster. The second referendum was the marriage referendum. I have a long history in that area, won't go into it all, but I think I set the pace by starting the civil partnership bill in 2004. That put a bomb on the government. I was out on the campaign trail in the marriage referendum. I was on the bus, I was making speeches, I was emailing people, and um, it was a wonderful, wonderful day when that uh, went through. Um, with regard to the bank inquiry, on which uh, Sean served with distinction, I nominated Mark McSharry oh, yeah. in, in order to ensure that this was a, a, an independent, I think, a bill of mine on electric convulsant therapy, banning its involuntary use, was recently passed. I had a direct provision bill that looked at every aspect of this situation, would have passed only for the last minute defection of uh, Sinn Féin. On abortion, I was the first person in 1977 to put abortion on an election manifesto. I commit myself to the repeal of the Eighth Amendment and the introduction of proper satisfactory abortion legislation. In the final week, three bills were attempted to be rushed through by the government. I stood against them. I was the only one. I couldn't get another person to second my amendments or to stand in the division lobby with me, but I held those bills up so in the new doll they could be reintroduced and perfected. Finally, during the past election, nothing whatever was heard about the environment. But I can tell you, I will talk about it when I get, if, if, if I get re-elected. Thank you very much. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, graduates of the University of Dublin, my name is Kevin Cunningham. Uh, I completed a PhD in political science in this great university, and for the past five years I worked in Westminster for the British Labour Party. However, you don't need this experience at all to know that the Shannon needs change. It's not enough to regard the Shannon as a platform for raising issues. Frankly, in, the current, in its current form, it doesn't quite have that mandate to pursue legislation. It's elected, remember, by just less than 5% of the, of, the of the adult population. And as a consequence, no one really cares about it. Certainly, the Dáil wanted to abolish it, and frankly, was uh, inevitably railroads legislation passed it at every opportunity. However, as a nation, we face no shortage of major challenges. We need to figure out how to protect ourselves from instability in the global financial markets. We need to ta figure out how to tackle climate change properly. We need to figure out how to create a healthcare system that provides both universal healthcare and high quality healthcare. We can do all these things, but we cannot really hope to have any success in doing so if we continue to fumble from one crisis to the next. Ladies and gentlemen, it's not enough uh, for the Shannon just to be for reformed, but it's the fact that we need, Ireland needs a reformed Shannon. While TDs under, understand the needs of their constituents, they cannot also be expected to possess expertise in all issues from global uh, finance to the possibilities of modern medicine. The Constitution thus rightly envisages that members of the Shannon play a supporting role in the Oireachtas. However, in this task, it's clearly failing. 
Members of the Senate, uh, most senators are elected from uh, sitting TDs, outgoing senators and councillors. I'm talking about the 43 uh, to the panels. Um, consequently, they are dominated again by former TDs and those that want to be a TD. Many senators, therefore, have their eye on the dole and use their position only as a personal profile run for the dole. This only intensifies the extent to which the dole continues to railroad legislation past the Shannon and renders the Shannon as being entirely ineffective in its ability to do, to do its job. It's ineffective in its ability to scrutinise secondary legislation and new proposals, but also primary legislation. It's not even allowed to look at money bills. The 2008 Blanket Bank Guarantee was a genuinely compass decision for the government, and it's a perfect example of where the Shannon really needed to be there. Um, not only was it the result of a financial regulator with insufficient oversight, but the decision itself was made in the entire absence of adequate expertise. It was made on the basis of the somewhat less independent advice of investment banks Merrill Lynch and also the European Central Bank, neither of whom were able to offer genuine expertise from the perspective of Irish interests. We now have this opportunity to reform the Shannon. Two, two and a half years ago, it was almost abolished. It was retained by a minimal margin of just 52% to 48%. And in five opinion polls, only 7% of the electorate wanted to see the Shannon uh, as remained as is. So its, prover oh, yeah. so its proverbial stay of execution is owed purely to this promise of reform. So the government, whatever it may, may be, will not hold a majority in the Shannon. Consequently, members of the Shannon can play a reform in refor reforming the Shannon into something more useful. However, their success in doing so, and the necessity, of, of course, in doing so, relies entirely on the extent to which they wish to see real reform or wish, or wish alternatively to raise their own personal profiles. I ask you to vote for reform in this election. Thanks. How you doing? William is my name. Uh, this is my flyer. I think most of you will have received it at this stage. There were a lot of flyers to go through, and uh, it took real dedication to read them all. I'm saying that as one of the candidates. For uh, those of you who didn't get the chance to open my flyer, that's what it looked like inside. It was access, education, innovation, and then under the pictures, I had a few policies, and then my website. I encourage you to, to have a look. Uh, there are a lot of great candidates here today. Many of them you will have recognized from their long-standing careers. Others you'll recognize from the media. There are a few new faces though. Um, I ran in 2011. I had just started working in Limerick. I was working on one of the estates, one of the infamous estates um, that suffered a lot from gangland violence. At the time, it was the, one of the most marginalized estates in Europe. The risk of poverty was 96%. Uh, I saw a lot of very harrowing things, including violence and crime, but most of all, I saw a lot of young lives slide out of view. I put myself forward for the Shannon as I felt they deserved a voice in the Shannon. Um, I learned a lot during that election campaign, primarily that a lot of Trinity graduates don't live at their registered address anymore. <laughs> I think a lot of other candidates can sympathize with that. Um, in terms of my policies, you can speak to me afterwards or you can look in my leaflet. They center around access and, and meeting young people in marginalized areas where they're at, expanding the access program. But really, it comes down to what do you believe in? Um, I believe in the Shannon. I believe in what it's supposed to stand for. It's supposed to stand for panels that are made up of experts who can use their experience and expertise to steer the public discourse and to add to the common good. I believe that Trinity, as the most prestigious educational institution in the country, should have senators who have an expertise in education. I believe that I'm the candidate with the greatest expertise in education. I have experience at primary, secondary, and tertiary level. I taught in Mississippi in a small little all-African-American all school run by a nun from Ackle Island, if you can believe that. A primary, I taught in a DESH school in Jobstown and Tala at secondary, and I worked with high risk reoffenders through the probation service. Uh, as I mentioned before, I'm currently working with at risk young people in Limerick. At every stage, I have experienced the challenges that those young people are facing. I've also served as president of the Trinity College Students Union, as president of USI, I have 10 years senior management experience in social policy and education. But most of all, 
I believe in young people. I believe that it's bad social policy and not bad young people that we need to address. If, if we just give young people a chance, you'll see what is possible. I've been involved with that myself down in Limerick where I set up a youth employment scheme where we took promising young people and gave them all the skills and training needed to become professional youth workers. I'm very proud to say that the first graduates have graduated from UCC with a diploma in youth and community and are now working. So in short, uh, I believe in the Shannad, I believe in Trinity, I believe in myself, but most of all, I believe in young people. My name is William Priestley. I'd really appreciate your number one vote. Thanks very much. Um, I'd like to thank Trinity College for organising and inviting me to this very positive event and all of you for coming tonight. It's quite nice to actually meet some voters uh, in what is probably the oddest, oddest election I've ever been involved in. Um, I've been living in Brussels for just over four years now and uh, for that's two referendums, one local European election and one general election in Irish time. In Belgian time there's also been one general and one regional election as well as European and local elections. And bar the European elections, I've been barred from voting in all of them. I've come home to get involved in the marriage equality referendum in the last general election and again had no legal right to vote whatsoever. Along with almost all the other one in, uh, one in six Irish people living abroad, I was participated from uh, every single one of these uh, elections. Aren't some of mo the most restrictive voting laws in the world? As so with, with essentially your automatic right to vote effectively ending as soon as you step on the airplane. <coughs> Uh, for 125 other countries allow postal, embassy or proxy voting. These mechanisms are not difficult as we're seeing for this election, uh, the postal balloting is taking place. We've got uh, Irish citizens abroad voting in this election and it's, it's all being done without, without, without too many problems. The, this, not need, this need not distort our democracy. Um, we're, uh, I'm running with Barry Johnson on the NUI panel who's here tonight also. We're running jointly on an emigrant manifesto which is looking at different mechanisms in which we can make sure that we can include the people, uh, the uh, recent Irish emigrants and encourage, put, may, put it into action the government's talk of welcoming these emigrants home. Returning emigrants face different challenges such as housing, as employment and uh, taxation and other issues and uh, we think that they need a special voice in the in Shannon, in Shannon Aaron. Uh, we want to make sure that the latest wave of emigration is the temporary one and to keep these emigrants engaged with, with the Republic. Um, I've been a committed environmentalist since a young age and before moving to Brussels I worked with Oisín uh, Coughlin, who's here today as well, standing on the panel at Friends of the Earth and also with the Irish Green Party. In Brussels I've been working on European environmental policy with the European Greens, with Greenpeace and with my current employer working on EU mar marine environmental policy. These experiences have reinforced my belief that the EU can be a crucially positive force in helping to protect and improve our world. The Union allows Ireland to have at least some voice in global governance and gives us greater influence in issues of, such as trade, development and the fight against climate change. If elected, I would promote an approach that always considered the environmental impact of all government actions. It's my belief that the role of the university senators is unique and that Trinity senators have played a prestigious and important role in highlighting issues and providing a constructively critical approach to government legislation. However, I also believe that it is easy to overpromise on our level of relative influence on the formation of policy. Even when standing together with the other independents of the NUI panel, we have only one tenth of the votes in the upper house, and working with others, including those in political parties, will be essential. Whole scale new legislation on issues with big spending implications is likely beyond our abilities, as is full reform of the upper house and the way it works. What we can what we can do, however, is pick specific, limited policy areas where we can focus our attention and maximise our impact. For me, standing as I am on a platform of environment and European affairs, I believe that the issue of the transatlantic trade and investment partnership is one area where a critical approach is desperately needed. This agreement, which at its core is designed to reduce non-tariff barriers, could pose a serious threat to many of the most significant achievements of EU policy in areas such as consumer and environmental protection, agriculture and health. We need someone in the Shannad who is, has enough of an understanding and engagement with the EU and its institutional actors to, criti to critique and tackle the agreement as it makes its way through the European and legislative processes. I hope you'll join me in supporting a fairer voting system, a greener Shannad and a more equal and stable approach to the European policy. Thank you very much. Uh, <clears throat> thanks very much, David. And I wish to uh, wish all of my fellow candidates, the, the very best of luck uh, in the Senate election, and it's a privilege to be amongst such, such talented and uh, very worthy candidates. So, Tom Clonan is my name. 
and I'm lots of different things. I'm a Trinity graduate, I was a primary school teacher, and now I'm an academic in DIT in Ireland's oldest journalism school. I'm a journalist in practice with the Irish Times as a columnist. I've written for every newspaper, The Examiner, The Independent, The Guardian newspaper. I provide freelance analysis for the BBC, for RTE. And I'm also an ex-army officer and a whistleblower who ended decades of sexual violence against women in our armed forces. I'm also chairman of the board of directors for Irish Dogs for the Disabled. And I'm a parent. And these are all highly visible, some high profile roles. But I'm also a member of an invisible community because I'm a carer for my 14 year old son, Owen. And Owen has a neuromuscular disease which compromises his ability to walk. He's in a wheelchair, he's legally blind. And he's in his first year in secondary school. He's a beautiful young man with his whole life ahead of him. But because of cuts, and austerity in the last seven, eight years, all of his services have been decimated. He has almost no physiotherapy, no occupational therapy, no hydrotherapy, no surgical review. And for the last four years running, he has been in a wheelchair that is too small for him. Can you imagine how he feels, what it does for his self-esteem as a young man on the cusp of adulthood? now developing a scoliotic curve to his spine. And as his parent, as a journalist, as an academic, as a disability advocate, I can do nothing for him. I have run out of road in this republic because my son and the 600,000 other disabled adults, children and elderly have been made second-class citizens by the economic and social policies that have been pursued in this country and of which there is no sign of change. So that's why I'm running for the Senate. That is my motivation. Because Ireland and Irish people are very good. Last year, Irish people in their hundreds of thousands voted to vindicate the equality and rights of our LGBT brothers and sisters. And if elected to the Senate, I will become a voice that will transform the narrative and the conversation about the inalienable rights of the 600,000 and the quarter of a million carers in this country who have become second-class citizens. As an army officer, the first thing I learned was leave no one behind. And serving in the Middle East, I saw at first hand the brutal slaughter of hundreds of innocent men, women and children. That has given me a commitment to social justice and Ireland's role in the world as a global citizen, a force for good in the world. If elected, I'll continue that tradition. As a feminist, ending decades of sexual violence against women, I'm a committed feminist. I am pro-choice and I will, appeal, I will campaign for the repeal of the Eighth Amendment. Finally, in the last two years, in the last six months in particular, I've spoken openly about my son's situation. And not one public representative has made any approach to me. And I've written about it and spoken about it on radio and television and every public forum. Not one public representative has approached me and asked me, was I okay? Is there anything they can do? That is because we are invisible. Vote for me. Vote Tom Clona number one. And let's make our 600,000 brothers and sisters of all ages and elderly, let's make them visible. And let's end a political class that do not act, see or hear in their interests. So I'm asking you, my fellow Trinity graduates, vote Tom Clonan number one. Please leave no one behind. Thank you. And I'm running to push climate action and social justice up the political agenda. If elected, I'll be an energetic, independent voice for a healthy environment, a stronger democracy and a more equal society. On a healthy environment, climate change is the greatest challenge humanity has ever faced. Has ever faced. And our political leaders are continually failing to, to understand the level of risk and the level of action required. And they're downplaying that risk even as we face real threats, particularly in Ireland. They're also failing to grasp the real opportunities for Ireland in the transition to a zero carbon society. In everything from the investment in warmer homes to encouraging and promoting communities to own their own renewable generation and renewable energy efficiency projects. Uh, if I'm running to give Trinity voters the chance to elect someone who will put climate action at the top of their agenda. And I want Trinity to lead the way. 
Trinity must divest its €6 million Euro holdings in fossil fuel companies. It must divest. It's the trend around the world among campuses. Trinity regards itself as a progressive institution, and it's one of the first steps it must take on the road of, to climate action. On the issue of stronger democracy, governments, when they're settled in office, never want radical political reform. So we have a real opportunity now, as we're seeing in Doyle reform, to actually force change. And we must start with the Shannon itself. I'm in favour of one person, one vote in, in Shannon elections, with every citizen, every Irish citizen, being given the choice of which constituency they want to vote in, and reforming the panels to really reflect all strands of Irish civil society. The draft laws are there to do that. It's time we got on and enacted them. It doesn't need constitutional reform. I also think the Shannon, and more broadly, is a place to, it's high time we gave citizens abroad uh, a vote in Irish elections, and I very much support the proposals of the Immigrant Manifesto. Um, on a more equal society, uh, it's clear that housing and homelessness must be the first urgent priority of the incoming government. It's a crisis that we have to address and that we've failed to address. In times when Ireland was a much poorer country, we built communities like Cabra and Crumlin to give people decent housing. There's nothing to stop us doing that again now. And on homelessness, I support the Simon Community's Housing First election pledge. We need to tackle homelessness urgently. Uh, I support the repeal of the Eighth Amendment. I'm pro-choice. Ever since I was a student here in Trinity 25 years ago, when Havana was being, was being sued by Spock, I've supported a pro-choice policies. And it's time that the, the next Shannon and the next Doyle took responsibility for legislating on abortion. It's not an issue that belongs in our constitution. The Shannon is not supposed to be a creature of political parties. It's supposed to reflect all strands of Irish civil society. I have 20 years' experience in civil society organisations. After I studied politics and sociology here, I worked for 10 years in the overseas aid and global solidarity sector as a community organiser among immigrants in Belize, as a promoter of fair trade certified goods in the International Office of the Fair Trade Movement in Bonn, and as, and as a policy and advocacy officer of Christian aid, working on the issues of Palestine, of trade justice, and of Irish overseas aid. And I've spent the last 10 years as director of Friends of the Earth, leading the campaign for a climate law that finally was passed with the help of TDs and senators of all parties, and particularly the three Trinity senators, that was finally passed in December of last year. I think one of the 60 seats in the Shannon should reflect the proud Irish tradition of global solidarity and the new imperative of climate action. Trinity has a long tradition of electing senators that, that pioneer progress on areas long neglected by the or lower house by the Doyle. If you vote number one, Ashton Cochran, I will continue that tradition for the 21st century. Thank you. Thanks very much, David. Um, it's nice to be back here in the Ed Burke, where I spent <laughs> many hours um, as, as a best student um, some, t some time back. Um, thanks to all of you for making the effort to come here this evening, and to everybody who's watching us online. I gather we're live on Periscope, uh, so to everybody who's, who's joining us from, from their laptops as well, um, you're very welcome. My name is Avril Power. I'm a graduate of Trinity College and of the King's Inns. I'm also a former president of Trinity Students' Union and I'm currently an independent member of the Shannon. I'm, since my election to the Senate in 2011, I've earned a reputation as a caring, progressive and effective public representative. I'm, while enjoying the advantages of being independent, I also have a proven ability to build cross-party alliances. This has helped me deliver positive change in a wide range of areas um, on everything from education to mental health, marriage equality and adoption rights. As the first person in my family to stay in school past the age of 15, the issue that I'm most passionate about is education. I'm, I'm very conscious of the opportunities in life that having a Trinity degree has given to me, and I believe that nobody should be denied that privilege. I'm, I've seen the difference that it has made in my life compared with my parents, my siblings, I'm, and my school friends who, who left school early. I'm, and I have worked as Trinity SU president as an advisor in the Department of Education and now as a senator. I am to secure improvements in education at every level, from primary right through to third level. In the Senate, I voted against the damaging education cuts of recent years and highlighted the impact that they're having on education, I'm, including at third level. I'm, what I've seen, it's, 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 it's sad as a, as a Trinity graduate, and we're all proud of, of having attended such a fine institution. And, best university in Ireland, one of the finest in the world. I think it's sad to see Trinity dropping um, in global university rankings because it's not getting the investment um, that it needs. Funding for third level has dropped by 
almost 50% um, in recent years, and that is affecting the quality, and it's something that should be of concern, not just to current graduates, um, but or to current students, but also to graduates as well. Um, it's because of my commitment to education that my campaign is backed by figures such as the former president of the INTO, the primary teacher union, John Carr, the former vice provost of Trinity, Professor Michael Marsh, and the current chairman of the DIT board, Professor Tom Collins. Um, my work on mental health has also won me the support of leading advocates such as Dr. Tony Bates, the CEO of Headstrong. And I'm also proud to have the backing of the chairperson of the Marriage Equality Campaign, Grania Healy. Since my TCD SU days, I have fought for equality and human rights at home and abroad. As a senator, I've championed the needs for better supports for older people and for people with disabilities. I've also pushed for an end to religious discrimination in school enrolment policies. I've been a powerful advocate for gender equality and I'm campaigning for the repeal of the Eighth Amendment. I was proud to join Amnesty outside government buildings yesterday in the lashing rain I am to campaign for the repeal of the Eighth Amendment. I've also addressed the UN about the plight of the Palestinian people and done a lot of work on, on global human rights issues. Another issue that's close to my heart is the rights of adopted people. As an adoptee myself, um, if I had been born in the UK, I would have had a right to my birth cert and turning 18 and to information about my family history, my medical history. In Ireland, we have no such right. That's something that I think is, is wrong, and I've used my position in the Senate to change it with my bill to give all adoptees a right to our identity, to our origins, past the Senate with unanimous support. Just an example of how I've worked on a cross-party basis. So as you can tell, fighting for equality and human rights is very important to me. <laughs> um, I, at the same time, as a Trinity business graduate, I'm conscious that our economy and society can only really reach their potential if we support businesses and promote entrepreneurship. Prior to my election to the Senate, I advised the government on policy in relation to Irish big, Ireland's biggest industry, tourism. As a senator, I've helped dozens of businesses, large and small, and also uh, push pro-enterprise policies in the Senate. So I know you have a difficult choice to make this evening, and I would ask you to vote for me for three reasons. One is because I'm a champion of pro-enterprise policies, but also an equality activist, because I'm an independent, but I also have a, a strong track record of working on a cross-party basis. And because as a proud Trinity graduate, I really appreciate your support. Thank you. Good evening, and uh, thank you for being here. Uh, the first time I sat in this theatre was about 35 years ago. Uh, everything I know about transport economics, I think I learned from, from Sean here, Sean Barrett. And David Norris, you might be um, surprised to remember, I was an active member of Dubes. And one of the first things we did around that time was we organized a transvestite competition. <laughs> when we were struggling for who we might have judge that competition, it was none other than David, and that was the first time I think we met. I've been 30 years uh, in business. Uh, the first 10 years I worked, I left, you know, after I left Trinity, I left with a business degree, uh, lifelong friends, and, and a world of possibilities. And I spent the first 10 years working in London and New York in the investment banking world and with some of the large family investment offices. Uh, after that, I embarked on my own entrepreneurial career and I started and built three telecom businesses, first in the States, then in Ireland, and then in Central and Eastern Europe. Uh, these are businesses I started on my own from a spare bedroom, uh, financed, built up, hired, and employed hundreds of people and raised uh, tens and tens of millions of finance to do that. So I know what it takes to, to build a business. Uh, the latter 20 years of my life, I've been uh, working as a venture capitalist, working with other Irish-based startups to help them finance their business and drive their business forward. And we've had many, many successes in that regard. Over the last 10 years, I've worked extensively with the leadership of this college as a member of the Board of Trinity Foundation, now the Provost Council, and uh, as Chairman of the Business School in Trinity. And some of you will know that we have a 70 million euro new business school underway. Uh, the Loose Hall will be demolished in the next month or so, and we should see a new business school in about two years' time. The reason I'm <coughs> running for the Shannard and the basis for my campaign is that I believe the Shannon and the Eructus in general needs a strong voice from business. Not only does it need to have a business influence, but we also need to ensure that our government acts in a more business-like way. 
In terms of the policy areas, they relate specifically to the experience I've just outlined. In my day job as a venture capitalist, uh, we gave significant support and input into the last budget, and some of our work has transpired into the finance bill, and in particular, the reduction in capital gains tax from the incredible 33% to 20% for the first million of gain for entrepreneurs. Uh, in the university sector, it's clear that the funding model is broken and we need to evolve to a more composite and new funding method. Uh, we input into the uh, Fine Gael Manifesto, and you will see some wording in that relating to increased management autonomy for our universities, which is critical. Uh, key people that have endorsed my campaign include Senator Fergal Quinn, Father Peter McVerry, David McWilliams, the last Provost of Trinity, John Hegarty, and many people and organizations across the business world, inclu including IBEC and the Irish Venture Capital Association. I'm not looking for a job. I have plenty of things to do, but I am looking to make a change in how things are done in government. We need fact-based decision-making, a focus on outcomes, and having a real impact. I believe I have the right blend of experience, skills, and energy to have that impact, and I ask for your number one vote. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you for asking me here. Thank you for organizing this evening. Who am I? I'm Anthony Staines. I'm a doctor. I live in Skerries. I'm here with my better half, Una, spending the evening of our 29th wedding anniversary talking to you. I'm <laughs> trying to persuade you to vote for me. So why should you vote for me? Oh, I've done a lot of things in my life. My earliest memories of this place are standing here. I was a Students' Union Executive Council member, a class rep for all of my time in college, standing here trying to persuade my colleagues to get up and act, to do things, to move, to support things. I'm a lifelong union, trade unionist. I have a lifelong commitment to social justice and equity. I'm probably one of the very few people in this room who's actually led a strike. I'm one of the people who led the 1987 doctor's strike. So I know the sharp, pointy end of industrial relations and of the health service in this country. I'm an academic now. Started out in child health. I now work in public health. And I study how health systems work. And more to the point, perhaps, how they don't work. I study our health system. And I study the health systems in many other countries. And I'm trying to find out ways of making our system work better. I'm trying to understand how we can spend 12% of our national wealth on a health service. That's 4% more than the European average. And get the mess we have at the moment. What's the Senate for? The Senate's a very constrained creature of the Constitution, but it's for legislation. It's for revision of legislation. It's a legislative arm of the state. And it has very little authority. There's no point in my saying I'm going to transform the health service. I'm not. But I am in the place to ask the right questions. I am in the place to bring my experience, my understanding of health services in 10 or 15 countries in detail, and 20 or 30 more at a more superficial level, to our problems. I am in a place where I can ask questions and get answers. What have I done? Well, I'm a researcher mostly. I've published over 150 papers. I've write grant applications, supervise students, teach classes, all the usual stuff that every professional academic does. I'm a writer, but I'm also an activist. I've worked for the last 16 years with a variety of community groups around the country, analysing and critiquing health impact assessments in proposals for large developments. I'm off to Cork in two weeks' time to talk at the third on board Planola inquiry into a hazardous waste incinerator ring of Skiddy. And I can assure you the health impact assessment for this is even more of a joke than the last two. Our planning system does not take your health seriously at any level. Why should you vote for me? I've done a lot of things. I'm a board member of the Higher Education Authority. I stepped down to run for this campaign. But I know how the higher education system works. I know where the money goes. I'm a board member of the Blood Transfusion Service. 
I've done, I've, excuse me, I've worked on mental health, I've worked on disability, I've done an enormous amount of work with Special Olympics Ireland, with people with autism, with people with intellectual disability, and I understand many of the problems that the services have in reaching those people. If you elect me, I'd be an articulate, effective advocate for change, and we absolutely need change, we need extensive change, and we need it now. I'm asking for your vote to achieve that. Thank you. Hello, my name is Sabina Brennan. Um, all of us here this evening are connected in three important ways. We are all graduates of the University of Dublin. We are all Irish citizens. And we are all human beings. The first gives us power. The second gives us rights. And the third gives us humanity. As graduates of the University of Dublin, we are an elite and powerful group. In this instance, we have the power to elect three university graduates. This evening, I am going to ask you to vote for me, to vote for a senator who will advocate for the rights of older adults, of carers, and of people with neurological conditions most of whom are not members of our elite group. Now I want you to step outside yourself for a moment. And I want you to step into the shoes. No, I want you to step into the slippers of an 87-year-old woman who has dementia. And I want you to imagine what it's like to have your right to be treated fairly, with dignity and with respect denied on a daily basis. I want you to imagine what it's like to have your request to go to the bathroom ignored until such time as you have to soil yourself. I want you to imagine what it is like to be sedated for simply walking up and down a hospital corridor. Now, as a dementia researcher in Trinity College, I was aware that these things happen in some of our hospitals and some of our institutions in Ireland. But nothing, nothing prepares you for when that 87-year-old woman is your own mother. It is simply not good enough. We must do better. Now, it's too late for my mum. Sadly, she passed away on Valentine's Day but it's not too late for your mum, and it is not too late for you. We here have the power to make a difference, the kind of difference that impacts on people's lives, even an 87-year-old woman with dementia. We're a small nation. But we have big hearts. Fairness is a fundamental feature of our free state, and I believe that we can realise a true republic of equals. We're already succeeding. We are already leading the world on human rights and equality in so, so many ways. But in other areas, we are not only performing poorly, but we are failing miserably. We are failing older adults, we are failing carers, and we are failing people with disabilities. Older adults are not just bed blockers. People with disability are not just care recipients. They are rights holders. They are members of the general public and they should not be marginalised, excluded or consigned to the appendices of policy documents. We can do better. We must do better. We deserve better health. We deserve better education. Indeed, I believe that we can be the best. We gradu graduated from Ireland's premier university. We do not like to fail. We do not accept second best, and we shouldn't expect anyone else to. By adopting a human rights and equality action plan, by investing in research, education, and in health, and by taking a few key strategies off government shelves, we can make Ireland the best country to grow up and grow old in. An Ireland where human rights and equality are an integral part of our natural, national identity and simply a natural part of our everyday lives. I'm going to be cheeky now and I'm going to ask you not just for your number one vote, but I'm going to ask you to ask three members of our elite organisation to also vote for Sabina Brennan. We can do better. 
Ramaga, David, thank you for the opportunity to be here tonight. Tonight, I'm delighted to be here. Uh, my name is Ivana Bacic. I owe a lot to Trinity. I came here first in the late 80s as a very shy, swatty student, quickly found a very welcoming environment, plenty of student politics to throw myself into, got involved in the women's group, the socialist and labour societies, and in my final year was elected president of Trinity Students' Union. It was an eventful and turbulent year. We were taken to court by SPUC, the Society for the Protection of the Unborn Child, and we were threatened with prison for giving information out uh, to women in crisis pregnancy in dire circumstances. Uh, I'm proud to wear a repeal of the Eighth Amendment badge. It's no surprise that all my adult life I have campaigned for repeal of the Eighth Amendment and will continue to do so, whether re-elected or not. Uh, we did escape prison with the help of a brilliant young lawyer called Mary Robinson, uh, but um, we were declared bankrupt and the case dragged on for many years. I went to London after graduation, like many of my uh, contemporaries, qualified as a barrister there and uh, worked there for some years and then returned to Dublin and have been teaching now in Trinity for many years. And one of the first things I did as an academic here was to initiate a law school scholarship scheme which paved the way for what we now see as the very successful Trinity Access Programme to give set-aside places at the time in law now across the college for students from disadvantaged backgrounds. I also practiced as a barrister for 16 years and in that capacity represented Catherine Zapone and Anne-Louise Gilligan in their groundbreaking case seeking the equal right to marry for gay couples, back at a time when David Norris was one of very few figures speaking publicly on that issue. My time working mostly in criminal practice gave me a passion for penal reform, for the rights of prisoners and for criminal justice work and I work, continue to work with the Irish Penal Reform Trust and others on these issues. I was first elected to the Shannad in 2007 and was given the privilege of re-election in 2011. Since 2011, I've been Deputy Leader of the Shannad and Leader of the Labour Party Group in the Shannad. I've introduced a number of private members' bills, including the first uh, private members' bill on climate change in 07 with Oisin and Friends of the Earth, uh, and uh, other legislation. And as a re in a record achievement for a senator, I've had three private members' bills that have become law, that are now acts. A bill to criminalise female genital mutilation, on which I work with Akidwa, uh, a bill to allow sol solemnisers from the Humanist Association to conduct legal weddings, and a bill, which is now an act again, to uh, end the pro potential for discrimination against LGBT teachers in employment, to amend Section 37. I've also authored two major reports for the Oireachtas Justice Committee, one on penal reform and one on women's representation in politics, which paved the way for the very successful gender quota legislation that led to the increased numbers of women elected to the Dáil in the recent election. And I've worked with others on a cross-party basis, with Senator Gillian Van Turnout on children's rights and on the successful amendment to end corporal punishment in schools, and on Shannad reform. I was one of very few sitting senators to make a submission to Maurice Manning's expert working group on Shannad reform. Finally, as a parent of two young daughters who's passionate about equal access to education, I championed and, and founded a group in our area which led to the setting up of a multi-denominational primary school, which is thriving, and I've been working with other groups to look for repeal of the law which allows schools to discriminate against pupils on the grounds of religion. And I've been very active on trade union rights all my working life, and I'm an active member of IFAT, and recently introduced a bill in January with the backing of SIPTU and the NUJ to allow for uh, collective bargaining for freelance workers. So I'm running for re-election, frankly, because I want to continue to work on all of these issues with your support, on women's rights, on the environment, on equality, on equal access to education for all, on secularism and on a more inclusive, tolerant and pluralist Irish society. And it's on that basis that I ask for your number one vote. Gura My name is Lynn Rowan. I am a Trinity student, an activist, a single mother of two from Tala. I've spent many years being a strong advocate for equality and access, and I currently serve as the president of Trinity College's Students' Union. People always tell me, <clears throat> we need more people like you in the Shannad. But what does that mean, people like me? What's different about me? Is it who I am, where I come from, my accent? Is it what I'm saying? I think it's because people like me don't usually have a voice. As a child, I loved to learn. I had high hopes and aspirations. But something happens to children from underprivileged areas. As you move toward your teenage years, you begin to realise that your neighbours and parents, they aren't doctors or pilots. And that begins to shape what is expected of you. I became a mother at 15, and I was told I had wasted my life. I was a teenager, 
And yes, society wanted to talk about me in the past tense, but I was determined. And with the help of a community education programme for young mothers, I was able to continue my education. And I began a career in community and addiction work. When the recession hit, I was developing drug services in Bluebell. The community sector was decimated by cuts. I was completely helpless, voiceless, and struggling to articulate the groundbreaking work that was happening. I had no power and no platform to make them, those who make the decisions in this country, hear my pleas. I didn't have a voice and I needed to develop one. I knew I needed education. I needed to be able to speak the right language. In 2011, I rolled in Trinity through the Access Programme. And last year, I was elected president of the Students' Union. And I received a national platform. I've been on television, on radio, in the newspapers. And I've worked hard to use that platform to bring a national visibility to the issues affecting education in Ireland. But I have become a story. And the headline of that story is, a single mother from West Halle has managed to not only get into Trinity, but be elected to the Students' Union of the most prestigious university in the country. Now imagine what kind of world we would live in if that wasn't a story, if it wasn't a big deal. Although my journey was long and filled with obstacles, it's a success story. But it's a story that shouldn't be so exceptional that it captures so many headlines. This shouldn't be a story about me. I want to create a society where it's so normal that someone like me would run for the presidency of the union or the upper house of the Oireachtas that nobody would bat an eyelid. That's what real equality of access looks like. There are walls around Trinity. And I'm not talking about the walls that make us on the inside feel safe. I'm talking about the walls that make the people on the outside feel like they can come in. Those walls aren't, nece walls aren't necessarily made of bricks and mortar. They are made of exclusion, of poverty, of social disadvantage. For some, these walls are made of financial barriers, of student debt or huge childcare bills. For others, it's the belief that they themselves hold that they can't come in. And for others, it's the fear that they will be kept out, found out, or told to get out, so why bother? I want to tear down those walls. I want everyone like me, who comes from a background like mine, to feel that they can access education and a better life. To be able to contribute to the conversation without having to fight. I want to create a society where everybody has equal access to public services, no matter their class, their income, or their beliefs. I want to live in an Ireland that values the power of education and doesn't let it remain at the bottom of the political agenda. I want to radically reform how politics is practiced in this country to make it more representative of the diversity present in Irish society. And I think that's what Trinity graduates want too. Trinity has instilled in all its graduates the value of a world-class education. As a member of the Shannon, I will fight to ensure those same opportunities are afforded to all. Education is what gave me a voice. I want the voiceless to be heard. And I am more than just my story. That's why I'm running for the Shannon, and that's why I'm asking for your vote. Thank you. Good evening, and welcome to you all. My name is Ethna Tinney. My single motivation to stand as a candidate for Shannon Aaron is the havoc that could yet be wreaked on this country by our own homegrown banks. Surely, you might say to me, the banks have learned their lesson. And I would say back to you, they certainly have. They were taught that if they steered their ships onto the rocks, they would be bailed out by the government with taxpayers' money. So why wouldn't they do it all over again? Let me tell you a story. In 2005, at a board meeting of EBS, we non-executive directors found out that we had wasted €6 million Euro on a failed merger with Rabobank. The board was dismayed, and there was silence. Then the most senior director said in his stentorian voice, we'll bury it in the accounts. Everyone breathed again, except me. The truth is that for senior managers and board members, banking is a thoroughly enjoyable game that excites and delights and pays extraordinarily well. Remuneration bears no relationship to ability. That has been proven again and again, going back decades. Irish Trust Bank, Merchant Bank and PMPA are just three of the more spectacular failures. Yet the bankers continue to play their game with the connivance of successive governments. 
Regulation will not work. These people always find a way around it. It's part of their game. How can they be stopped? By a simple mechanism called competition. Think Aer Lingus and Ryanair. If I'm elected to Shannon Aaron, I will introduce legislation to set up a state-owned bank called the Mortgage Credit Corporation, or MCC for short, similar to ACC and ICC, which both served very well our country. The board will have representation from the central bank and the Department of Finance, but government appointments will be prohibited. Bonuses will be outlawed. Senior management will be on fixed salaries. There are thousands of experienced and principled workers made redundant by the banks who will be delighted to bring their skills back to help a resurgent Ireland. Rules will be strict but fair. Applicants faking salary levels will be shown the door of MCC, as will property developers, though some loans will be extended to small and medium enterprise, currently dying on the vine. MCC will offer mortgages at European interest rates, that's roughly 2.4%. Our cartel banks heard together on a rate of around 4.2%. For people with a modest mortgage of 250,000, for example, that gap of 1.8% costs them 4,500 euro per annum. There is a market in that gap. Okay. Then an amazing thing will happen. The cartel banks will realise that they have to lower their mortgage rates if they want to compete, and their greed will be checked. The other legislation I want to introduce concerns government bank bailouts. This will be legally outlawed, except through a referendum of the people, as happened in Iceland in March 2010. There, 98% of the people voted no, and a mere 2% voted yes. And were they not quite right? Why should the people of any country be forced to hand over their money to failed private enterprise. If the banks know they will not be bailed out in future, they will regulate themselves <coughs> properly and they will not fail. And in case you're wondering, Iceland is flourishing these days. Thank you. All that is required for the triumph of evil is for good men to do nothing. That quote is attributed to Edmund Burke, after whom this hall is named. I want to be the good man who does something. My name is Owen Meehan. We've embraced digital technology and the internet to an extent we could never have imagined. We shop on eBay and Amazon. We order groceries from Tesco and SuperValue. We talk to friends and family on Skype, Fiber and WhatsApp. We bank online. Some of you are posting to Twitter and Facebook. We plan our holidays, book hotels and flights online. We read newspapers on our iPads, download books to our Kindles, podcasts to our iPhones. We keep our photographs on Flickr, our videos on YouTube, and listen to music on Spotify. We use debit cards, leap cards, loyalty cards, and easy pass tags without thinking. We get to places by using Google Maps and SatNav. We don't even look up books anymore. We just Google it. This technology brings great benefits and convenience to our lives, but at a cost. And that cost is an increasing violation of our personal privacy and threats to our personal safety and liberty. <coughs> Everything you purchase, download, listen to, view and read, every website you browse, every booking you make, every share and like, even your physical location is eagerly recorded and logged. It's called our digital footprint and that huge trove of personalised data is of great interest to companies, governments, the police and hackers. The data is not the problem, it's who has access to that data, why they have access, what they use it for and whether that use is appropriate. There is no one in our Oireachtas with the extensive technology or internet expertise necessary to properly defend our privacy and rights in this increasingly technology-connected world. I've worked in the IT industry for 35 years with international tech leaders like Intel and Dell and national companies like Bank of Ireland. My broad range of IT technical knowledge and managerial experience has prepared me to be your representative in the Shannon. I have an MSc from Trinity, I'm a Chartered IT Professional and a Fellow of the Irish Computer Society. By electing me to the Shannad, you will ensure there is the appropriate technology expertise in our Oireachtas to defend against the growing threat to our citizens' privacy and data protection. I will work to ensure a proper legislative environment to counter cyberbullying and cybercrime. I will work towards a safe internet environment for children, teens and vulnerable adults whilst protecting the rights of free speech and expression. But a Senator is also a citizen and so has a duty to society. I have a particular interest in our health service. 
If it was not for our health service, my wife would be dead. She had two life-threatening episodes and six operations over two years. So I know how valuable our health service is, and I want to ensure we have an efficiently managed, properly funded health service open to all. As a father, I understand the problems of trying to get your children enrolled in a local school. I believe that access to education should not be based on whether you adopt a particular religion. We are a modern, progressive society, and the state must now ensure a quality of access for all children to state-funded schools. As a husband, I understand the importance of affordable childcare. I will work to make accessible, affordable childcare generally available. Apart from improving the quality of life for working parents, this is the single most important gender equality measure the state can provide. But our senators are also national representatives. I will work to make sure Ireland continues to be the digital hub of Europe and the first choice location for internet and tech businesses setting up in Europe. One of the reasons they choose Ireland is because of our highly educated graduate workforce. This means the state must view third level education as a national strategic priority and not just a funding problem. We must invest in digital technology infrastructure such as rural broadband and mobile coverage so that the benefits of the tech economy can spread to all regions of Ireland and all regions can contribute to the talent pool and resources these companies need. Finally, our Senators have responsibility to our college. I have attended Trinity as a full-time postgrad student and I later returned to work as a researcher on a European Unit funded project. So if elected, I will defend your rights and privacy, champion health, education and childcare, promote Ireland as the tech hub of Europe and represent our college in the Oireachtas. Thank you.